unemployment benefits dropped more than expected last week. Raising hopes of a stronger labor market rebound amid fears it may be stalling. The Labor Department says jobless claims fell to 881,000 last week. That's down from just over a million the week before. Economists polled by Reuters predicted 950,000 applications for unemployment. So the reported number is encouraging. And the number of people continuing to collect unemployment dropped by 1.24 million for the week ending August 22nd. But other labor market indicators show that job growth is slowing down, suggesting the labor market recovery is losing momentum as fiscal stimulus fades. The Institute of Supply Management's Tuesday report showed that while U.S. manufacturing activities surged to a nearly two-year high in August, employment continued to lag. And the Federal Reserve's Wednesday report also delivered mixed signals. While it showed an increase in employment, it also said some districts reported slowing job growth and increased hiring volatility. The Labor Department is set to release its jobs report on Friday. And I came across a graph today on Business Insider. It shows just how deep the job losses were during each economic crisis. First thing I noticed was just how bad it's been this time. The next thing I noticed was that the losses have been deeper and slower to recover with each subsequent crisis, more or less. I was curious why that is, so I asked Daniel Lakaya, he's chief economist at the Tresses Hedge Fund. The reason why we get out of every crisis in a, in a completely uh, weaker way, in, uh, particularly for the job creation. We start with a bigger loss and then uh, the recovery is slower. It's fundamentally because injecting monster amounts of liquidity and increasing government spending delivers afterwards a much weaker result in terms of both job creation and real wages for most workers. So I assume we've had some form of stimulus during all of these crises, but why does it seem to be getting worse with each one? This is very interesting. The reason, because every time the stimulus is larger. The stimulus is not only larger, but more directed towards uh, incentivizing government spending and protecting bloated government spending. Those two elements make the recovery weaker. In fact, if you look at it, it is a transfer of wealth from the savers and from real wages to government and its crony sectors. So the larger the stimulus, the weaker the recovery. You, th- that doesn't mean that there doesn't have to be a stimulus. Let's uh, not uh, get things in- incorrectly. One thing is to have some form of stimulus to allow the economy to recover. And another completely different is what we have seen, for example, in some of the proposals of the Democrat Party and the Labour Party in the UK or in the United States, which is to basically use crisis to increase government spending in things that have nothing to do with the crisis at any cost. And one point you touched on just now was that a lot of these stimulus packages tend to benefit, we'll call it the people at the top or the people who have access to it. I believe there's a term I've heard called the Cantillion effect maybe. Is this really the case and and where do we see it exactly? Well, think about it. When you inject massive amounts of liquidity very early on in a crisis and you increase government spending immediately, who gets benefited? The public sector and those that have access to debt and that have access to assets. At the same time, what we see is a very quick recovery in uh, financial asset prices, in uh, bonds and equities. Therefore, who benefits? Money creation is never neutral. Therefore, it always disproportionately benefits the first recipients of the money created and the ones that pay for it are the last recipients of that money. So who are the first recipients of newly created money, artificial money creation? Government and financial markets. Who are the last recipients? The workers, salaries and small businesses. I appreciate your balanced analysis as always, Daniel. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure. And another major hotel in New York City is shutting its doors permanently. The health crisis has devastated the hotel industry here in New York and across the country. Entities Phil Zoe spoke with the head of a hotel association here to see how they're feeling. 
the mayor has said there's going to be no indoor dining, so there's no business in restaurants and hotels. So it's just a double, triple whammy. The Hilton Times Square Hotel in New York is closing permanently. According to a public filing, 200 employees will be laid off starting October. The president of the Hotel Association of New York City told us many hotels have already closed and many more may close soon. Already a bad situation has become significantly worse. You know, we had 55,000 employees working. Now they're barely 10,000. And we have, the business is down 85 percent with over 150 hotels closed, uh, some permanently. Dantapani says the 14-day quarantine for visitors to New York City decimated the hotel industry. This is the worst he's ever seen it. The quarantine has killed all domestic business, the 14-day quarantine. This is worse than any great recession that we had in 08, 9-11, you know, dot-com crash. In a letter to Congress last month, the American Hotel and Lodging Association said nearly one out of every four hotels could face foreclosure. The industry could lose more than $120 billion this year. Dantapani says analysts are telling him businesses aren't coming back until next September and that it'll be another four years before the industry returns to pre-pandemic levels. Phil Zhou, NTD News, New York. And the European Union has a new strategy to secure access to rare earth metals. It's part of a move to be less dependent on suppliers like China, Chile and South Africa. Rare earth materials are used widely in everyday electronics and defense products. And the pandemic is highlighting the world's increasing reliance on electronics and technology for remote work, education and communication. The EU is predicted to need around 60 times more lithium and 15 times more cobalt for electric vehicle batteries and energy storage by 2050. China currently provides 98% of the EU supply of rare earth elements. Turkey supplies 98% of its borate, while Chile meets 78% of Europe's lithium needs. European Commission Vice President Maro Sevcevic says we need to diversify supply and make better use of the resources within the European Union. The plan seeks to set up a raw materials alliance by the end of this year. It aims to start a partnership with Canada and interested African countries starting next year. The EU also wants to study ways to reuse, repair and recycle products that use rare earth minerals. Previously, the bloc used the trade policy to reduce the risk of reliance. It has made repeated complaints to the World Trade Organization about China's restrictions on raw materials exports. We see similar decoupling here in the U.S., but will it continue regardless of who becomes president? I asked Amela Khan that question. She's been following these developments very closely. She's the Washington correspondent for the Epoch Times. Decoupling has become a very important topic in Washington, and I think it will gain more momentum uh, after the election uh, because both candidates, uh, Trump and Biden, uh, have promised to reduce reliance on China, especially for critical supplies. And um, we know that for decades, companies moved their production operations, uh, their supply chains uh, from uh, from U United States to uh, countries like China to be more competitive, uh, to reduce costs. But those days are over. And these company boards now have to, um, because of the first U.S.-China trade war and the COVID-19 pandemic now, uh, have forced them to reduce uh, their uh, supply chains, to, to reshift, to um, relocate their supply chains, to make it more resilient. And they have to redesign their supply chains. And both candidates are pushing uh, for this as well. And for example, uh, President Trump in his second term said that he would uh, incentivize companies, uh, provide tax credits. Uh, he said that he would um, provide 100 percent expensing deductions for critical uh, uh, industries like robot robotics, uh, like pharmaceuticals, uh, to make companies produce in the United States. And he said that his plan will bring about one million uh, manufacturing jobs to the United States. Biden pledged to bring two million manufacturing jobs to the United States. He, his strategy is different. Uh, he wants uh, the federal government to be the big purchaser. So he wants to buy federal, he wants federal government to buy 100% uh, products made in 
America. He wants to bring more transparency to the content of U.S.-made products. He said that he would invest $400 billion in his first term uh, to make federal government buy from domestic suppliers. So he is trying to use government footprint, government uh, power uh, to promote domestic manufacturings, manufacturers, especially small ones. So that's his plan, and he wants to bring 2 million jobs. According to McKinsey's study, his plan would bring 2 million uh, manufacturing jobs to the United States. So I see that this momentum will continue, the decoupling uh, conversation will continue uh, even after the elections. Interesting insights. I'm sure China won't be as happy to hear them. Amel, I appreciate your insights. Thanks so much as always. Thank you. And the British Premier League is cancelling its $600 million partnership to broadcast games in China. The league says it didn't get paid. It means soccer fans in China will miss out on the new season, but it'll also leave a big hole in the league's accounts. It's already facing a record pre-tax loss this year. Is it a political move from China? It's hard to tell. Details on the matter are reportedly private. The UK ha has recently banned Huawei and opposed Beijing's so-called national security law in Hong Kong, definitely angering China. The former Chinese license holder Suning Holdings says, simply a consequence of the pandemic. And it's soccer out and banking in. Citibank is the latest American financial giant to make inroads in China. It's the first to get a domestic fund custody license. That means it'll be able to hold securities and sell services to China-based mutual funds and private funds. This is new because China prefers to build up its own companies rather than giving the business to foreign players. We see this with making foreign companies partner up with Chinese companies to get access to the Chinese market, then forcing them to transfer their intellectual property to the Chinese company. But under the phase one trade deal, China has to loosen restrictions for American financial institutions. Ask Curtis Ellis about it. He's policy director at America First Policies. He's been writing on U.S.-China matters for decades. American financial service industry providers have been trying to get into the Chinese market for decades. One of the concessions that the Chinese Communist Party made in the phase one trade deal was to allow some of these financial service industry players to enter the market, enter the China market, without a Chinese partner, to operate in China without a Chinese partner. And uh, this is a big deal for the, for the Wall Street firms, for the financial services industry. Uh, I suspect that China is now letting this go forward as sort of a, you might say, a good faith gesture or to show that they are a reliable partner, and they do, in fact, live up to their agreements. And uh, here, look, we're letting these, these American uh, financial service companies, such as Morgan Stanley and BlackRock and others, come in and, and, and operate just like we said we would in phase one. Now, there is another dimension to this as well. Every company, every large American corporation that operates in China has been effectively co-opted. And the Chinese Communist Party has used them as leverage against Washington and used them as lobbyists in Washington to lobby for pro-China and pro-CCP engagement policies. Uh, to be, let me explain. Uh, the, there, there's a, a mountain of evidence that shows that we really should be wary of China's, uh, the CCP's growing influence uh, in, in the United States, around the world. It's not become a reformist uh, element. It's actually antithetical to many of our values and freedoms that we, that we cherish and that we live by. Uh, they did not become more market oriented. They still continue a range of abuses on the economic and trade front, not to mention the human rights abuses, which have only multiplied since we first brought them into the World Trade Organization and really gave them permanent normal trade status back in 2000. So, uh, but the American companies that did enter the China market have effectively been turned into lobbyists to continue the open engagement policy, which has benefited Beijing more than it has benefited the American people. 
But any time that we have tried, or those of us who have been wary of China have tried to, uh, to wake up Washington to these abuses, there's a pushback from uh, the American corporations, whether it's media corporations that want to sell movies in China, or whether, as we've seen, the, a glaring example is what we saw with the National Basketball Association, the NBA, uh, when, when somebody had the, uh, had the temerity to criticize China's crackdown on the Hong Kong pro-democracy demonstrators, the NBA immediately disavowed uh, the coaches and the players who did that. And you saw some of the, some of the bigger players, LeBron James, uh, spoke out saying, don't, don't criticize China because we could uh, lose some money if that happens. Well, this is writ large in Wall Street. Curtis, I really appreciate your insights as always. Thanks so much. Thank you. And still to come this evening. The UK's trade minister announces a new round of trade talks with the United States. He says it'll start next week. And Apple is the latest big tech company to pass on its new digital services tax to consumers and developers. We have details after the break. When you look at TV networks in America, a soundbite and fighted out culture prevails on news and commentary programs. As a Canadian, I'm fascinated with America, and I wanted to offer American thought leaders an opportunity to share their thoughts in a deep dive format where we can explore their ideas together. And so American Thought Leaders was born. The world's most brilliant thinkers believed that open discourse was the key to greatness. However, all around the world, we see that discourse is being stifled and political agendas have subverted media. The Epoch Times launched its Global Thought Leaders program to bring back this great tradition of free thought. As the host of American Thought Leaders, every week I interview some of the most intriguing minds on the most pressing issues of our time. Be sure to check out our new episodes every week. The UK's Trade Department Minister has announced a new round of trade talks with the United States. He says they'll speak to both sides of the U.S. political divide before this year's election. UK Trade Department Minister Greg Hantz says Britain will begin a new round of trade talks with the U.S. starting next Tuesday. Britain is trying to carve out new business relationships around the world following its exit from the European Union and all its trade deals. Britain has prioritized striking a deal with the United States, but the potential deal is clouded by November election and the possibility that a new administration and new priorities might take over. But Hans is downplaying the risk. He says in terms of the U.S., clearly we talk with all parts of the U.S. political system. We make sure that senators, members of Congress, governors from both parties right the way across the United States buy into a future U.K.-U.S. free trade agreement. Britain's top five targets for post-Brexit trade deals are the U.S., Japan, Australia, New Zealand and the EU. UK ministers expect to finalize a deal with Japan in the next few weeks. And the department said the UK's next round of talks with Australia will begin on September 21st. And Apple is the latest big tech company to find a way to pass on the cost of digital taxes in Europe. The cost will end up with app developers. Anthony's Patrick Hayden has more. Apple says it will increase its charges for app developers after several countries implemented a new digital services tax. It's the latest tech giant to pass on the costs to its consumers. What's unusual here is that it's a very direct pass on. And you can see that Google have just put their prices up by 2% to pass on this specific cost. Another partner at Blick Rothenberg says it's difficult to prevent this sort of thing from happening. Ultimately, tax almost always seems to be borne by the individual by the time it's passed down the chain. Um, you know, you would 
we've seen that the digital services tax is going to be passed on by the big tech businesses to their customers. European nations originally tried to launch a new global tax on big tech, but negotiations stalled several months ago. It's well beyond herding cats. You've got, I think, about 27, 28 countries in the OECD. You've got over 100 other companies that are participating in this project. Trying to get agreement is very, very difficult. The White House has said the digital service tax is not fair and it discriminates against American companies. She said the ultimate solution is to have a global tax authority, but that's about as likely as having a global government. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. And Amazon is opening its first online-only Whole Foods in New York City. The company says the move is in response to the growing demand for grocery delivery during the pandemic. In its latest innovation, Amazon's first permanent online-only Whole Foods store started taking delivery orders in Brooklyn September 1st. The brand new location will offer free two-hour grocery delivery in the Brooklyn area. Its actual location is called a dark store meaning it won't be open for in-person shopping. And still to come, with people staying at home and not driving their cars, Ford has figured out a way to help new buyers save on insurance. That and more after the break. you making their business work online there are people searching headed in your direction so since people are still looking for what you do GoDaddy is making it possible for you to create a website for free start now at GoDaddy.com 5,000 years of Chinese music and dance in one night just so inspiring it makes me want to go dance it's breathtaking brilliant it's out of this world He ascended to the throne during the most turbulent times in the Joseon dynasty. Despite that, he treated his people well, had great ambitions, and led the country towards a new renaissance. That eventually earned him the title as one of the wisest kings in Korean history. Lee Sun on NTD America. Qualcomm is boosting its production of 5G smartphones and backing new 5G connected laptops. It wants to make 5G accessible to billions of people. U.S. chip maker Qualcomm launched its 5G ready version of its Snapdragon 4 chips. The new chip can run on cheaper phones priced at $125 to $250 that will be made available early next year. On Wednesday at a scale-back IFA Consumer Technology Fair in Berlin, Qualcomm's president Cristiano Amon said the chip will make 5G accessible to all smartphone users. He also announced a 5G platform to support always-on, always-connected laptops. These laptops intend to provide secure connections to company networks to suit people working from home. Amon said the demand for this technology will outlast the pandemic. Qualcomm is the biggest producer of 5G chips globally. CEO Amon predicted that including all chip makers, there will be around 750 million 5G smartphones shipped in 2022, topping 1 billion a year later. That would see 5G catch on two years faster than was the case with 4G. And General Motors and Honda are teaming up in North America to share platforms and make a range of vehicles together. A person familiar with the matter said savings would run in the billions of dollars for each company. Pressure to cut emissions and move toward electric vehicles have strained even the biggest players in the auto industry. So the collaboration eases the pressure. GM and Honda have already worked together on the design of cruise origin autonomous vehicles. They're also collaborated on fuel cells and batteries. And Ford is giving new buyers a way to save on insurance. It's partnering with Metro Mile to offer pay per mile insurance will be available in most Ford 2020 and 2021 models. 
Metro Mile will directly track driver mileage and charge them accordingly. It means the less you drive, the less you pay in insurance. Metro Mile can save Ford owners an average of $741 a year. A person with any car brand can use Metro Mile just by using its mobile app and plug-in device to track mileage. But the Ford deal main means direct implementation into a compatible car's onboard software. Traditional car insurance companies have faced criticism and even lawsuits for not offering enough price flexibility during the pandemic. And that's the latest business updates for today. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.